Hello, I'm Ning Ding. I'm from the International Business School of Hangzhou University. Today, I'm going to use the video lecture to talk about how to conduct a quantitative research and how to analyze the quantitative data and report it in the student thesis. In today's lecture, I will mainly go through the following four topics. First. How can quantitative research methods be applied in student thesis? How to report the descriptive statistics? What are the types of hypothesis testing for bachelor and master students? And how to conduct that? In the thesis, students are required to provide evidence-based recommendation. For quantitative research, how can we um, set up the recommendations based on quantitative data analysis results. Now let's go to the first topic. How can quantitative research methods be applied in the thesis? In this topic, I will go through the following subsections. First, what are the potential research methods that bachelor and master students frequently adopt? And the, for the survey, especially questionnaire survey, how to design a valid and a reliable questionnaire? In order to test the reliability, what are the possibilities and how to conduct it in SPSS? How to formulate research questions and a corresponding hypothesis for quantitative research? And accordingly, how to set up a conceptual model for the quantitative research. There are three main methods frequently adopted by the thesis students. First one is the questionnaire survey. This is the most frequently used method for bachelor and master students. And the second one is observation. Observation has its uh, uh, subjective research route. But the new business trend using observation is getting more and more quantified. The next one is using secondary data to conduct a quantitative research. Students can go to OECD World Bank. They all have a free and public database. Students can also contact their uh, country's government, governmental statistic bureau to get uh, local data. Using secondary data is very useful for student thesis concerning analysis of a macroeconomic situation. There are several frequently asked questions in student thesis. First is, in the graduation project for bachelor students, we require students to collect primary data. Then some students are wondering, do I still need to use secondary data? Or is it allowed for me to add some secondary data into it? Of course, besides the primary data, secondary data analysis is also very necessary, especially when we want to discuss the research context or the background information of the research. Another frequently asked question from the students is, um, the questionnaire survey needs a larger sample size. It is too time consuming for a bachelor thesis student, isn't it? My experience tells me, not really. Analyzing the interview data may take much more time. For questionnaire design, I would like to share one example with you. This is a typical questionnaire survey from a student. In this questionnaire, they first ask the demographic factors such as gender, age group, and then the student asks about health consciousness. And you can see there are four parallel questions. I reflect about my health a lot. 
I'm very self-conscious about my health. I'm alert to changes in my health. I'm usually aware of my health. So these four questions are all five-point Likert scale questions, and these four expressions all direct to almost the same meaning of that. We call these are the parallel questions for one construct, and this construct is health consciousness. And then let's move to the next part. Question number seven, eight, and nine, and ten. They are all talking about the purchase intention of organic food. Question number seven is: I intend to consume organic products in the future. Eight: I'm always interested in buying more organic food for the family needs. Nine: I always intend to look for organic food, although outside the city. Number ten needs our attention. It says, "I'm not going to recommend organic food to my friends." So, from the meaning perspective, that number ten is different as question number seven, eight, and nine. It asks from a negative perspective. Although these four questions are all designed to ask about purchase intention, but number ten asks from different direction. This is frequently seen in a published questionnaire survey, because the researcher intentionally designed some questions from different direction in order to check whether the respondents answer the question seriously or they do understand what the question meant. Some students ask, "Do they need to design their own questionnaire survey? Is it allowed?" That they adopted from、uh, some journal publications. Of course, it is allowed, and actually, we do suggest to students to adopt the questionnaires, either partly from this、uh, publication or partly from that publications, and combine them, or adopt the questionnaire、uh, questions and tailored to、uh, his or her current research context. So designing a valid and reliable questionnaire actually is a tedious work, and we do suggest the students to conduct a comprehensive literature review before start the questionnaire survey, so that they can find out a valid and reliable publications for the questionnaire survey. After we have the questionnaires, we need to test the reliability. And the synonym for reliability is the consistency. That means the respondents who fill in our questionnaires, whether their answers are consistent to each other. There are three ways to conduct reliability test. The first one is test and retest. That means I administer the questionnaire to a group of the respondents after one week, one month. I administer the same questionnaire again to the same group of respondents. Then you may notice: first, it is time-consuming, and second, it is actually difficult to achieve because you have to revisit the same group of respondents. It's quite difficult in reality. The second method is using equivalent forms. So I'm not going to revisit the respondents, but I will administer the questionnaire survey at one time. But perhaps I will prepare two types of questionnaire survey. So one type asks questions from this perspective. Another type of the questionnaires asking the same, similar questions but using different expressions. So these two questionnaire survey are two equivalent forms. Then you can imagine, okay, it is doable, but the problem is, you have to ask the respondents to fill in the questionnaire twice, although two different types of questionnaires. But that's very time-consuming. The third method, which is the frequently adopted method by researchers, is called internal consistency. This is what I have just shown. I present the questionnaire, and within this questionnaire, there are several parallel questions. 
In the future, I will just find out whether the answers to these parallel questions are consistent to each other. And using some equation, some calculations, I can generate a coefficient. And this is called Cronbach's alpha. For some uh, rules of thumb, for Cronbach's alpha, if it is higher than 0 0.7, we tend to think this is a reliable questionnaire. But if it's about some factual knowledge of the people relying on their memories, so we need a higher Cronbach's alpha, such as 0 0.8 or even 0 0.9. But if it's just about people's opinions, their feelings, their emotions, so it's quite changeable. So we can lower it to 0 0.7. And actually, in some publications, I have also seen they are using 0 0.65 as the threshold. And how to find out the Cronbach's alpha from uh, SPSS. Actually, it's very simple. Now I'm going to demonstrate it. I'm now going to use SPSS to check the reliability of my uh, questionnaire survey. This is the data view of the SPSS, and I put all the original data here, and uh, I can also switch to the variable view by clicking the tab here. This is the variable view. This is the place where I can define each variable, such as the first one is gender, and in the questionnaire, it corresponds to the question, what is your gender? And if I click the values, zero means female, one means male. Okay. And uh, for health consciousness, I have designed four parallel questions adopted from the previous questionnaire survey. Uh, from the published article. I reflect about my health a lot. I'm very self-conscious about my health. I'm alert to change in my health. I'm usually aware of my health. So these are all based on five-point life skill questions, asking uh, whether the respondents care about their health, are conscious of their health. And, uh, I wanted, I wanted to check whether the respondents answer these four questions in a reliable way, which means their answers should be consistent. So if I go to Analyze, Scale, Reliability Analysis, I just input these four parallel questions. I reflect, I'm very self-conscious, I'm alert, and I'm usually aware of my health. This is for parallel uh, items into items box. By default, SPSS has already selected alpha. This is the Chrome box alpha here. And then I click OK. The output is very simple. It is this one. So the Chrome box alpha is 0 0.94 for four items. This is the output of the reliability test. You can see the Cronbach's alpha is here, 0 0.952. And there are four parallel questions selected to test this Cronbach's alpha. As I just mentioned, if this number is higher than 0 0.7, as a rule of thumb, we will accept that this questionnaire is reliable. And I also did it for the next one, purchase intention. But this purchase intention, don't forget, it has a four items, four parallel questions, but one of that asks the questions from a negative direction. So how did I do it? I will demonstrate it in SPSS again. Now I'm going to use SPSS to conduct a reliability uh, test for the other variable, the dependent variable, purchase intention. From the variable view, I have seen that these questions uh, are slightly different as the previous one. Uh, for the fourth one, the original one uh, seems to be, I am not going to recommend or get food to others, to my friends. Well, the rest of the three, I intend to consume 
organic products. I'm always interested in buying, and I'm always intent to look for. So this indicates positive direction that I want to buy the organic food to purchase intention. But the number ten is asked uh, in the in a negative direction in order to check whether my respondents seriously. Uh, filling the questionnaire, and they do understand my questions. So if I don't use the converted answers for uh, this uh, question number 10, I go directly to analyze, scale, reliability analysis, and I select question 7, 8, 9, 10, the original answers to the box items, then click OK. Then you can find that the uh, Chromebox Alpha test fails. Because the theoretically, Chromebox Alpha should range from 0 to 1. But this time, I even have a negative number. So this shows there are something uh, problematic with uh, these uh, four questions. So what I need to do is I convert uh, question number 10 into a positive way. So I convert it into the next variable, uh, PL4. This one, again, it's an ordinal variable. And it, I repeat the reliability test. Instead of choosing the original answer from the questionnaire, I choose the converted answer here. Convert it. Yeah? And then I click OK. The Chromebox Alpha comes. It is a 0 0.95. It indicates a quite high uh, reliability coefficient. Some students ask, um, can I take all the questions in my questionnaire into one reliability test? No, this is not recommended. Reliability test is used to check the consistency of respondents' answers to one construct. In other words, if one construct has a three up to seven parallel questions, I will take these questions into reliability tests, such as health consciousness. After testing this one, I move to the next construct, such as uh, the dependent variable purchase intention, and select the other parallel questions. So that is the meaning for reliability test. Now I'm going to talk about the research questions and hypothesis in quantitative research. Uh, first, we need to distinguish three different types of uh, quantitative research. The first one is a descriptive research. For the descriptive research, we just take a static snapshot uh, most of the time, uh, and we use the questionnaire, um, which we have no controlled variables. We are not going to manipulate the variables. The examples in student thesis is, how has uh, the Dutch organic food market changed over the past 10 years? Or what are the most popular organic food among 60 plus groups? The other type of quantitative research is uh, exploring the relationship between variables. From this type of uh, research questions, we can easily discern the variables which we want to map the relationship between them, such as this one, how is a health consciousness related to the purchase intention of organic food? Or is health consciousness positively related to the purchase intention of organic food? For both research questions, we can see there are two variables. One is a health consciousness, and the other one is purchase intention of organic food. The difference is, for the first one, I just want to explore whether these two variables are related to each other. But for the second one, the green one, I wanted to find out whether they, are, they have positive relationship, which means the higher degree of health consciousness, the higher, uh, the stronger purchase intention of organic food. So these are the corresponding uh, hypotheses. For the first research question, I can uh, hypothesis like A is related to B, 
For the second one, I have more specific direction, whether A is positively related to B. The third type of quantitative research, we can compare the variables. Examples as, do females and males have different purchasing intention of organic food? Or are females more willing to buy organic food? Again, there are two variables in these research questions. For the first one, gender and purchase intention of organic food, and the same as the second one, gender and purchase intention. But the difference is, for the first one, I only wanted to find out whether there is a gender difference, but I don't care whether female or males who care more about, uh, who have a st um, more stronger, much stronger um, purchase intention. But for the second one, it is more specific. I wanted to find out whether females are more willing than males to buy organic food. So the corresponding hypothesis can be, is A doesn't equal to B, or is, uh, does a, um, is a larger than B? Yeah, so these are the two corresponding hypotheses to different research questions. Now, if I move on, I can um, conceptualize it like this. First, I have a new hypothesis. The new hypothesis is the starting point for my testing. It just assumes that A equals to B, or A is not related to B. There is no relationship between these two variables. And then I have two directions to formulate my Hypothesis. The first one is called non-directional hypothesis. And for this one, I will formulate it like A doesn't equal to B. I don't care A and B, which one is bigger. I just want to find whether they are different. Or A is related to B, but I don't care about whether it's a positive or negative relationship. And directional hypothesis. In the directional hypothesis, it is more specific. I want to find out whether A is larger or smaller than B, whether A is positively or negatively related to B. So these are the two types of hypothesis. Some students ask, how can I decide it is a directional or non-directional hypothesis? It is all based on literature review, secondary data analysis, or sometimes based on unstructured or semi-structured interviews with the, um, course, with the relevant uh, person in the company. So if the previous literature has already found A is larger than B, then my hypothesis had better to be directional. I want to also find out whether A is larger than B. If the previous research, they have never addressed this problem, I might be the first one to explore this relationship or to compare these two variables. It's all start from scratch. There is no theoretical support for me to assume a directional hypothesis. Then I'd better use non-directional hypothesis. Instead of uh, finding out whether A is larger than B, I just want to find out whether A is different as B. Now let's summarize it. For the relationship research, the research question looks like here. How is a, a HC, health consciousness, related to the purchasing intention? Is this re positively related to that? And the hypothesis are, HC is related to their purchase intention of organic food, this is a non-directional hypothesis. And for the non-directional hypothesis for comparative research is uh, females and male customers have a different purchase intention of organic food. For relationship research, the directional hypothesis is more specific. HC is positively related to purchase intention or 
females are more willing to buy organic food than males do. If I'm going to set up a conceptual model, I can do it like this. For relationship research, I use an arrow to connect the independent variable and the dependent variable. And sometimes our students also design the demographic factors, try to find out whether this kind of factor moderates the relationship between dependent and independent variable. And for the comparative research, I can chop the independent variable into different categories, such as whether gender is related to the purchase intention, and I separate the gender to females and males. So this kind of a graphic representation are the typical conceptual model that we can see from the quantitative research. Other frequently asked questions are, is it necessary to show sub-research questions and their hypothesis together? And the answers are, there is no fixed rule, but most of the time we find it's not necessary because the sub-research questions are also very specific and the hypothesis just a repetition of the main content of the sub-research question. So it is not very necessary to repeat the sub-research question and hypothesis at the same time. So if your hypothesis are already very specific, we can skip to present the sub-research question, but directly present the hypothesis. The next frequently asked question is, where to present the hypothesis? Make it like a shopping list at the end of the literature review or at the beginning of uh, uh, the methodology. Sometimes we have also seen some students present the hypothesis in the introduction chapter. Now, first, uh, logically saying that hypothesis should be embedded in the literature review because each hypothesis needs to be based on the corresponding theoretical discussion. As I said, we have directional and non-directional hypothesis, and we need to demonstrate why it is non-directional. In the previous uh, literature research, uh, they talk about this and that, which hasn't addressed this problem yet. So after this theoretical set discussion, I conclude, I, I uh, formulate a non-directional hypothesis. Or from the previous research, they talk about this and that, and the later I find, hey, it's, uh, it gives me a very specific direction. And then I formulate a directional hypothesis. So logically, the hypotheses are all based on theoretical discussion. So it needs to be connected or by the end of the corresponding discussions and needs to be logically uh, ordered in the literature review. Some students asked whether it is necessary to state the new hypothesis every time. Actually, it's not necessary because by default, every, researchers, we, every researcher, we, we know that uh, it means there is no relationship there is no difference. So it's not necessary always to state what the new hypothesis means. After knowing how we can use quantitative research to collect the data, now it's the time for us to conduct a descriptive statistical analysis and know how to report it. In this chapter, I will mainly go through the following topics. What are the central tendencies? dispersion, and how to visualize them, and how to report it in the student thesis. Let's still review. This is the example of the questionnaire survey. And this time we are going to find out the different types of measurements. The first one is nominal. Nominal means this variable is measured in different categories but these categories have no ranking. For example, gender. It is measured in two categories, female and male, but there is no ranking between these two categories, no ordering. 
The next one for the measurement is ordinal. The typical example is the age group. For the age group, in the current questionnaire survey, there are four groups, younger than 20, 20 up to 40, 40 up to 60, and 60 plus. And these categories have a, an ordering. So 60 plus is the highest level, 40 up to 60, is one level below and the lowest level is younger than 20. So when these categories can be ordered, we call this is ordinal variable. And the next one is scale. Let's look at these parallel questions. For each question itself, it's an ordinal variable because they are measured in five points like the scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. They are ranked. They are ordered. But if we take four questions into account together, then we, find, we try to find out the average of these four questions answers. Because it's a nonsense for me to report the answers, the respondents' answers to each individual questions because they are parallel. So the best way is to add them up and divide it by four to find out the average of these four parallel questions. And then it becomes a quantitative variable, which have decimals. And we call this is a scale variable. Now, let's look at the central tendency. For central tendency, it means mean, median, and mode. And the mean is what we normally say uh, the average, the average of the variables such as health consciousness or purchase intention. If, I, if, if 288 people fill in the questionnaire, I want to find out what is the average purchase intention or average degree of a health, of health consciousness. So I need to report the mean. And the median means the middle point. So 50% of the data is below this number, while 50% of the data is above this number. And the third point is mode. Mode is also applicable for categorical, for uh, nominal and ordinal variable, because it shows the most frequent number or category, such as 200 people filling the questionnaire, and actually, the most of them are from the group 60 plus. 100, 150 people are from this group. Then I will say the mode is the 60 plus age group. Besides central tendency, we also need to measure the dispersion of the data set. And frequently used method is range, variance, and standard deviation. And for range, the calculation is quite simple. We use the maximum value, the highest value, to minus the minimum value, the lowest value. But you can see this one has a drawback, is we only take two values from the data set. We totally ignore all the values in between. So this, this range uh, can be very biased. And then people developers uh, the variance, which measures the deviation of each individual value in the data set to the average, to the mean. But sometimes we find the variance is quite big, which is not very comparable with the mean. So in order to make the, vari the dispersion more understandable, then the statistician square root the variance and then they get standard deviation. So the same as variance, standard deviation represents the distance between each individual data to the mean, to the average. In order to visualize it, we can use different types, such as bar chart or pie chart. There is no fixed rule to say which one is better, but just for our own habits, that bar chart is mainly used 
to compare the volume between two variables. But pie chart is mainly used to show the proportion, the percentage of the subcategories. Another way is using the line graph. Yeah, the line graph is mainly used to show the development or the relationship of the variables. Now, let's look at our uh, sample questionnaire again. And this time, we try to redefine it from a statistician's perspective, such as which variable is nominal, ordinal, or scale. The first one, Gender is a typical nominal variable. It has two categories, which has no ordering. And the second one, the age group, is an ordinal variable. It is also categorical, but all these categories has a ranking. And when we average the parallel questions of a health consciousness and a purchase intention, then we get a numerical variable. And in SPSS, they are defined as a scale. We can also define it as nominal ordinal variables are mainly qualitative variables, while scale is a quantitative variable. But how to report it in the census? Now let's look at how students can report the descriptive analysis in their report. Frequently, we have seen the table such as this. Students shows how many people uh, fit in the questionnaire, how many are females, how much percent, how many are from the age group younger than 20, how much percent of that. They tend to think this is the descriptive analysis. Now we have known Actually, it's not. For descriptive analysis, we need to report the central tendency and the dispersion. So only having this kind of table, I would like to argue this is a description of the sample. It's not the real uh, statistical analysis results. So this kind of table can be moved to the methodology chapter to show how the sample looks like, whether it's representative of the population. But for descriptive analysis, in as the first part of the findings chapter, I prefer to see an extended table, such as this. For the independent variable, healthcare, uh, health uh, consciousness, I calculate the average and the standard deviation for each subcategory. For the dependent variable, purchase intention, I present the mean and the standard deviation for each subcategory. For one variable, which is categorical variable, it's impossible to calculate the mean, the average and the standard deviation. Then I show the mode. So for example, for females, the most frequently selected answer for uh, the question about the shop where they buy the organic food. For females, it's grocery in neighborhood. For males, it's online shop. And for the age group, online shop, supermarket, supermarket, and grocery in neighborhood. So from this kind of comprehensive overview of the descriptive analysis, I can get a quick picture how uh, the female and the males, their attitudes towards uh, health consciousness differs with each other or in line with each other, and how their preference of the shop to buy organic food are different. These are all about statistical analysis for descriptive analysis. Now let's move to the uh, third chapter, how to conduct hypothesis testing. In this chapter, I will first introduce some basic concepts. Then we will find out how to compare the means between two sample groups and how to explore the relationships between the variables. And I also would like to share some advanced statistical analysis technique with you, such as multiple linear regression and the moderator analysis. These two are also frequently used uh, by our CESIS students, mainly the master CESIS students.
let's first look at some basic concepts, which are the grounds for the hypothesis testing. The first one is population and sample. Population means the entire group, the entire set of the data, the, the whole, the complete group of the people. And of course, it's impossible for us always to get a data from every individual unit from the population. In order to save time, we have to randomly select sample from them. And this sample, we assume they are representative of the population. And then the next concept we need to know is degree of freedom. Degree of freedom refers to the number of values involved in the calculation that have the freedom to vary. It is related to sample size, which is always calculated by n minus 1. So if the degree of freedom increase, it also stands that the sample size is increasing. The next concept is confidence interval. Confidence interval is a range of values we are fairly sure our true value lies in. And then corresponding to that, we also talk about margin of error. The margin of error is the range of values below and above the sample statistic in a confidence interval. Let's say a 95% confidence interval with a 4% margin of error means that the statistic will be within 4 percentage points of the real population value 95% of the time. And another frequently used term is confidence level. In statistics, the confidence level shows the probability with which the estimation of the location of a statistical um, parameter, uh, for example, the mean in a sample survey is also true for the population. Or, frankly speaking, the confidence level shows how much percent I'm confident what I have found from the sample is also um, will also come from the population. For example, a 0% confidence level means I don't believe that what I have found from the sample will also be found in the population. While a 100% confidence level means it's no doubt that's what I have got from the sample. And no matter how many times I repeat it, I will also get it the same results from the population. We will revisit this basic concept frequently in the following hypothesis testing. Let's start first from how to compare the means. We normally have independent and dependent variable. In my case, the purchase intention is the dependent variable, which is measured in numbers because it is the average of four parallel questions. And the independent variable, if it is about the gender, it's nominal variable, it's qualitative, and it has only two categories, female and male. And then I can use independent sample t-test. So let's see how we can do with it. Independent variable is the gender, which has only two categories, female or male. The dependent variable is a numerical variable. Is measured in numbers because it's the average of four parallel questions. It is purchase intention. This is my conceptual model. And then I formulate my new hypothesis, which is there is no gender difference regarding the purchase intention of organic food. The non-directional hypothesis looks like this. There is a gender difference regarding the purchase intention of organic food. For this non-directional hypothesis, I'm not going to find out whether female or male has to have the stronger purchase intention. I just want to find out whether they are different. For the directional hypothesis, it could be based on previous research. 
that females tend to have stronger purchasing intention of organic food than males. Then I go to SPSS to conduct independent sample t-test. I'm now going to uh, find out the, the difference between uh, female and male customers regarding their purchase intention. And this is my SPSS file on the variable view. And I'm going to go to the data view. And here I see this are the gender. Uh, and here uh, the PI means the purchase intention. That is my dependent variable. And then I'm going to go to analyze, compare means, and conduct an independent sample t-test. I'm going to select the gender into the grouping variable, that is my independent variable, and then select the purchase intention, PI, into my test variable, which is the dependent variable. And still, you can see I, uh, the OK button is still inactive. So I need to activate that. Where? It is here. Yeah, so I need to define the groups. You need to tell SPSS which two groups are you going to compare. So group one is the female, which is represented in the number zero. And group two is one. So this is what I have here. Yeah, and then I type one, zero and one here and click continue and then click OK. So the first table is the descriptive statistic table and the second table is my hypothesis testing whether female and male show different purchase intention. And here I look at the key value, degree of freedom and the significance value that is the p value. Now let's try to find out the relevant data and interpret it. I first read the significance value of the Levin's test for equality of variance. This is the p-value for this Levin's test. If this number is larger than 0 0.05, I need to read the first row of the t-value. If this number is smaller than 0 0.05, then I need to move to the next row to read the t value. So in the current case, it is 0 0.894. It shows it is, signif it is safe for us to read the first row of the t value. I will write on the interpretation like this. At 95% confidence level, we accept the new hypothesis which states that there is no significant gender difference regarding purchasing intention of organic food. And t-value is 0 0.00, while degree of freedom is 286, while the p-value is larger than 0 0.05. So where did I get the p-value? It comes from here, the sick two tails is here. And degree of freedom 286 is here. And this is the t value. Okay. Now let's move to the next test. So when um, I'm going to uh, analyze to compare the uh, means between different age groups. So age groups is again a qualitative variable measured in categories, but different as the gender. For the age group, I have more than two categories, younger than 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, and 60 plus. And dependent variable, still uh, the purchase intention, which is a quantitative variable. In this case, I'm going to use one-way ANOVA for the test. Let's look at how we can conduct this one-way ANOVA analysis. So this is my conceptual model. For the independent variable, it is the age group, age group, and I chop it into four categories. And for the dependent variable, it is again the purchase intention, which is a numerical variable. Now I'm going to formulate the hypothesis. The new hypothesis again is about there is no difference regarding the purchase intention. And 
the non-directional hypothesis is there is a difference regarding the purchase intention of organic foods. And for the directional one, I can assume that the elderly people, 60 plus, they have stronger purchase intention to buy organic food than other age groups. This is how I conduct the one-way ANOVA in SPSS. Now I'm going to compare the age groups regarding the purchase intention of organic food. This is the variable view of my SPSS, and the second row is the age group. And if I click the values here, I can see that I have four age groups. Zero represents the age group younger than 20. And then one is 20 up to 40. Two is 40 up to 60. And three is the 60 plus. And the PI represents the purchase intention, which is my dependent variable. Now I go to analyze, compare means, one way ANOVA. Then I select age group into the factor, which is the independent variable. And I scroll down to PI purchase intention to the dependent variable. And for one way ANOVA, by default, there is no output of descriptive analysis. So I need to click on options and select the descriptive so that I can get the mean and the standard deviation of uh, the purchase intention for different age groups. Then I click continue, and then I click OK. Again, the output has uh, two paths. The first one is the descriptive uh, uh, statistical analysis, and the second one is the ANOVA, which is for my hypothesis testing. And from this one with ANOVA, I see that the F value uh, is 68.44 with uh, between group degree of freedom 3 and 281 for the within group degree of freedom. The p value is smaller than 0.05. This indicates at 95% confidence level, there is a significant difference among these age groups regarding purchasing intention. But at this moment, I still have no idea which age group has a stronger uh, purchase intention than the other age groups. So after knowing there, there exists a significant difference, it is the time for me to conduct post hoc analysis. I go to analyze. I repeat what I have just done for the one-way ANOVA, compare means one-way ANOVA. This time, I click the post hoc. And then uh, there are uh, different uh, names, terminology for the statistical package. And I choose uh, Tuki. This is one of the most frequently used uh, package to do the multiple comparison. I click uh, Continue, and then I click OK. Yeah. And this time you can find I have several uh, ex extra outputs. One is the post hoc test, the multiple comparison. And for this multiple comparison, it shows that each age group is compared with the other age group one by one for two by two comparison. Uh, for example, for uh, people younger than 20, they compared their purchase intention with the purchase intention of uh, the group 20 up to 40. And the p-value shows there is no significant difference. That means for these two age groups, their purchase intention of organic food has no statistical, dif statistical difference. And for the second one, uh, age groups younger than 20 compared with 20 up to 60. And then I notice the p-value is smaller than 0.05. So at 95% confidence level, uh, people older than 40, younger than 60, have stronger uh, purchase intention than people who are younger than 20. And the same as the last age group, 60 plus. It seems that this age group has the strongest uh, purchase intention of organic food in comparison with the other three age groups. So we put this is a post hoc test.
Now let's look at the output and how we can interpret it right into the report. So we first read these values. At 95% confidence level, we reject the new hypothesis, which states that there is no significant difference among customers' age groups regarding purchase intention of organic food. So that means actually we did find there is significant uh, difference among age groups. The F value, and in the brackets, we report the uh, degree of freedom. The first one is the between group degree of freedom. Three means N minus one. So in total, there are four groups. It corresponds to four age categories, four age groups. 281, it counts for all this valid data among these four age groups. So each group minus one. So in total, 281. The F value is 68.44, and the P value is smaller than 0 0.05. And this is the post hoc test, the output from the post hoc analysis. We can find that 60 plus group has the strongest purchase intention of organic food in comparison with other age groups. The purchase intention of 40 up to 60 group is significantly lower than that of 60 plus group, but it's still significantly higher than the younger groups. For people who are younger than 20 or 20 up to 40, there is no significant difference regarding purchase intention of organic food. So this is how we can interpret from one way ANOVA. Now let's move on to the next type of the statistical analysis. In this case, if I change my dependent variable from purchase intention to the shop where people tend to buy the organic food. And then it becomes a qualitative research now because we ask the people to select the, uh, from the uh, options we offered, online shops, grocery in the neighborhood, or supermarkets, or others. So these are categorical variable. In this case, the, case, the uh, independent variable is qualitative, dependent variable it's also qualitative. If both are qualitative, we are going to use the chi-square test. This is the conceptual model to find out the relationship between age group and shops for purchasing. So both are measured in categories. This is the original question from my questionnaire. The new hypothesis states customer age groups are not related to the types of shops for, purchase, uh, for purchasing organic food. And the uh, alternative hypothesis shows they are related to each other. Okay, I'm going to explore the relationship between the age groups and the, purchase, uh, and the shops where people prefer to buy the organic food. The age groups is an ordinal variable, it is a categorical, and the shops is also measured in categorical uh, variable, which is nominal because there is no ranking between these categories. So the easiest way for me to do that is I go to analyze, this time I go to descriptive statistics, and I select the cross tabs. I select the age groups into the row, and the shops where people tend to prefer to buy organic food to the columns. There is no fixed rule, but just for our habits, we tend to put the independent variable into the rows and dependent variable into the columns. And this is descriptive uh, statistics uh, cross tabs, but I still need to conduct hypothesis testing. And I click the statistics button here, and then, and then I select the chi square. Then I click uh, continue. And then click uh, OK. From this output, I can see a descriptive analysis here. Yeah. And this is the chi square test, which is the hypothesis testing. 
at its shows, the chi square value, Pearson chi square value is 182.80. And degree of freedom 6, the total number of valid cases is 281. And the p-value is uh, smaller than 0 0.05. So there is a significant difference between the age groups and their preference where to buy the organic food. And from this descriptive one, I can see that people who are younger than 20 or 40, they have the stronger tendency to buy the organic food from online shops. But for people who are older than uh, uh, 20 and uh, to 60, they prefer to buy it in the supermarket. While for 60 plus group, they like to uh, purchase the organic food from the grocery in their neighborhoods. I can also visualize it. I repeat what I have just done. Go to descriptive statistics. Select a cross tabs. This time I select a display cluster bar chart. So I select this one. And then in the output, besides what I have just had, the tables, I also have a visualization of uh, uh, the preference of uh, uh, the shops to buy organic food and among different age groups. Now we are going to interpret from the output of the chi-square test. We first look at these numbers. At 95% confidence level, the customer's age groups are significantly related to their purchase intention of organic food. Then I report the chi-square value, the degree of freedom, the n value, the valid cases, and the chi-square value is 182.80. The p-value is smaller than 0 0.05. So the new hypothesis is rejected. Actually, the age groups significantly differ to each other regarding the purchase intention of organic food. Let's move to the next one. If both independent variable and dependent variables are quantitative, they are measured in numerical values. And then we need to use correlation analysis. The example is health consciousness and purchase intention. Health consciousness also has four parallel questions and we average the answers, so it is measured in numbers. Purchase intention is also quantitative. Then we are going to use the correlation analysis. The new hypothesis is these two variables are not related with each other. The non-directional hypothesis is HC is related to PI. And directional hypothesis is it is positively related to purchase intention of organic food. Now in SPSS, I can do it like this. I'm now going to explore the relationship between the health consciousness and purchase intention. And in my questionnaire, these are two quantitative variables. This in my variable view of the SPSS. This is the HC, health consciousness, and this is the purchase intention, PI, and both are numerical variables, quantitative. So in SPSS, they are defined as a scale in the measurements. I'm going to go to analyze, correlate, and elaborate because I have two variables. I select the health consciousness here and the purchase intention here. Because I have a directional hypothesis from the previous research, I have already learned the higher level of consciousness, the stronger the customer's purchase intention of uh, organic food. So, so I'm going to use a one-tailed test in order to get uh, more specific, specific findings. And then, then I click OK. OK. 
The output is quite simple. It shows that uh, the Pearson correlation coefficient, the R, is uh, 0.93. It's quite a strong relationship. And the p-value is smaller than 0.05. So my conclusion is, at 95% confidence level, there exists a strong relationship between consciousness of health and the purchase intention of organic food. I will write down like this. The customer consciousness of health is significantly and strongly related to their purchase intention of organic food. And for R, it is 0.93 p-value smaller than 0.05. Perhaps you may ask, what is the threshold for R as a strong relationship or weak relationship? Just for a rule of thumb, that when R is larger than 0.7, we take it for granted that this is a strong relationship. When it is smaller than 0.3, it is a weak relationship. And for the values in between, we normally say this is a moderate relationship. But actually, the real calculation of R depends on the sample size and also depends on uh, the nature of the questions. So it's, uh, it's just a, a rule of thumb. It's not the real scientifically uh, justified method. Now, the new hypothesis is rejected. It is a positive relationship. It indicates the higher degree of uh, health consciousness, the stronger purchase intention of organic food. So let's look at this overview again. If the independent and dependent variables both are quantitative, we use the correlation analysis. If the independent and dependent variables both are qualitative, we use the chi-square test. If the independent variables are qualitative and the dependent variable is quantitative, then we look into the independent variable, how many categories they have. If it has only two categories, such as junior customer, senior customer, or female and male, or Dutch or non-Dutch, then we use the independent sample t-test. But if the qualitative variable, independent variable, has more than two categories, three or even more, such as the nationalities, different age groups, uh, different regions where the people come from, and then we use one way ANOVA. Now let's explore some analysis at a higher level, such as multiple linear regression. Multiple linear regression, instead of using only one independent variable, we look at a set of independent variables. And we wanted to find out in this set of variables, which one is the best predictor a particular predictor variable is still able to predict an outcome when the effects of other variables are controlled. So the new hypothesis is a set of variables is not able to predict a particular outcome, a dependent variable, or a set of variables is able to predict a particular outcome. Let me show you how we can conduct a multiple linear regression in SPSS. I'm now going to use the multiple linear regression to test whether a set of variables can be significant predictors for the dependent variable. And I go to the variable view of my SPSS file. And the independent variables are gender, age group, and health consciousness. So, so these two, two variables, variables are categorical variables. One is nominal, the other one is ordinal. And the health consciousness is a numerical variable, and in SPSS it is defined as a scale. The dependent variable is purchase intention of organic food. I go to analyze, regression, and then linear. 
I select the, the dependent variable purchase intention into the dependent box. And then I select the independent variable gender, age group, and health consciousness into the independent variable box. By default, uh, it, the method is enter. At this moment, I just use the basic SPSS uh, function to conduct the multiple linear regression. Okay. So I click uh, OK. The output, uh, the most important uh, table in the output is the model summary, ANOVA, and the regression coefficients. Now let's interpret it. From the model summary, we look at the adjusted R-square. It shows the effect size is represented by the adjusted R-square, which is 0 0.876. Approximately 87.6% of the variance of purchasing tension of organic food is accounted for by the combination of customers' gender, age group, and health consciousness. Then we move to ANOVA table. It shows the hypothesis is tested with this uh, F-test. An F-value is 671.84, p-value smaller than 0 0.05, and in this case, even smaller than 0 0.001. So we can reject the new hypothesis and conclude that a combination of people's gender, age group, and the healthcare, uh, health consciousness can significantly predict their purchase intention of organic food. Looking at the coefficients table, we first check the p-values. And in the current case, the p-values are here. 0 0.001 for gender, 0 0.004 for age group, and 0 0.000 for uh, health consciousness. So that means all these three variables, they are significant predictors for the dependent variable purchase intention. And it also showed that the strongest predictor is health consciousness. So we look at the B, the slope data, and then we formulate uh, the equation. The estimated purchase intention comes from 0 0.33, which is the intercept, minus 0 0.18, the slope types times the gender, the gender slope times the gender, minus 0 0.09 times the age group, and the plus 0 0.99 times the health consciousness. Suppose we find a new um, potential customer who is a female, and who is uh, 65 years old, so I will code it zero here, the gender and age group will be coded as uh, three, and then the health consciousness she reported as uh, four. Uh, agree that health, uh, uh, health is important. And then I can, purchase, I can predict what, uh, how high, how strong her purchase intention is for the organic food. For the next technique, we are going to look at moderate analysis. Moderate analysis is an extension of correlation analysis. Look, this is the simple linear uh, correlation analysis. But if we add, we introduce the moderator, such as gender, and we wanted to see whether gender moderates the relationship between health consciousness and the purchase intention. So if there is no um, moderating uh, effect, then we tend to see uh, we have two regression lines, the male and the female, and these two lines are roughly parallel to each other. Yeah, so that means gender doesn't matter. So no matter for female or males, it shows almost the same strong relationship between health consciousness and the purchasing tension. So these two lines 
tend to be parallel. But if there is an interaction effect, then these two lines tend to cross to each other. Then we can see, okay, for both female and males, it sh they showed a positive relationship, but for males, it looks much stronger than that of females. So these two lines tend to cross to each other or have crossed each other. This is called interaction effect. Now I'm going to use SPSS to demonstrate it. I'm now going to use SPSS to conduct a moderate analysis. In the variable view, I see my variables. PI is the purchase intention. This is my dependent variable. And HC is the health consciousness. This is my independent variable. And gender is my uh, moderate variable. So uh, before I go to conduct a moderate analysis, I first need to centralize uh, these two variables and then to find out whether they have an interaction effect. So I will do it like that. I go to analyze descriptive statistics and I select the descriptive. And for both moderate variable and the independent variable, I'm going to centralize it. Um, and so first I choose gender and health consciousness. And then I click the same standardized values as variables. This is a very convenient function for us to find out how each value deviates from the corresponding mean, the, the average. So that's the standardized value. And I click OK. And then you can see in the, variable, uh, in the data view, I have two newly added data. And the first one is gender. The other one is uh, the centralized uh, health consciousness. And the next step, I'm going to go to transform compute variables. I'm going to set up a new variable called the moderator. And this moderator comes from uh, the centralized uh, score of uh, gender to, to be multiplied by the centralized score of uh, health consciousness. So this is the new variable, the name I, uh, I name it as a moderator. Now, this is the last uh, column in the data view, and this is my moderator. I'm going to uh, do the uh, regression analysis using linear function again. And for the dependent variable, purchase intention of organic food. For the independent variable, I'm going to choose uh, the gender. And uh, the health consciousness. The last one is the moderator, which comes from the multiplied result of the centralized gender and the health consciousness scores. And then I click OK. Again, the uh, three uh, tables are very important, the model summary and the uh, ANOVA test, and also the coefficients. Uh, for interaction, very quick uh, check is to conduct a, to, to have a scatter, uh, uh, scatter plots for that. So I go to graphs, Lexi dialogs, I choose a scatter, scatter diagram and the simple scatter diagram. And this time I choose a purchase intention into my y-axis, which is the dependent variable. I choose a health consciousness to the x-axis, that is my independent variable. And the set markers by, by the gender, that is uh, what I want to see, whether it has an interaction effect with the health consciousness on purchase intention. Then I click OK. In the graph here, you can see the red dots are uh, representing males, while the blue dots representing the females. Okay, so if I double click this graph, I come to the chart editor view, and I can add the regression line for each uh, subgroup. Okay, so if I click that one, then you can see 
The red line represents the regression line for the males. It has a perfect uh, positive relationship. Well, for the females, it also has a strong relationship, but uh, not as strong as uh, that for the males. So for males, healthcare uh, healthcare contributors can perfectly predict their purchase intention. While for females, it's uh, uh, the effect is not that big. So you can see these two lines cross with each other. This indicates there is an interaction effect. Now. I can put a visualization into the report, and I need to report it. The interaction term is statistically significant, p-value smaller than 0 0.01, indicating that the interaction term contributes in a meaningful way to the predictive ability of the regression equation. So there exists a significant interaction effect of gender. For males, the health consciousness can perfectly predict their purchase intention of organic food. For females, the relationship between uh, HC and PI is significantly strong, but not as strongly as that of food for males. Before I end um, the moderator analysis, I also need to caution you to distinguish moderator uh, analysis and mediator analysis. This is the example of moderator analysis to see whether the relationships is moderated by one moderate variable. And this is an example of a mediate effect, mediate analysis. So uh, first look at whether HC will be connected with trust and trust will further connect it to the purchase intention. And the aim of uh, a mediate analysis is not to find the three types of relationships, but it should be done on the prerequisite that HC and the PI are not significantly related with each other. And then that means HC will not directly relate to PI. Instead, it will be related to trust and the trust will be related to PI. So this is the mediator effect analysis. Some students ask, if my p-value is a 0 0.048, which is very close to the boundary, 0 0.05, can I lower the confidence level from 95% to 90%? in order to address the significant difference? Of course not. If you have 0 0.048, just honestly report it. And in statistical hypothesis and, uh, test, we tend to have four kinds of results. The first one is, in reality, there is uh, no uh, significant difference, and we also accept the uh, new hypothesis we find, right, there is no significant difference, so we are quite happy. And in reality, there is a significant difference, so H0 is not true. And in my statistical analysis, I also find H0 should be rejected. There is a significant difference in reality, and I also found it, so I'm happy again. But if in reality there is no significant difference, but you find there is a significant difference, like the current one, the p-value is 0.048. It's smaller than 5%. So you tend to conclude there is a significant difference. So you have the tendency to send innocent guy into the jail because perhaps if you enlarge your sample size, or if you extend your data collection time, so you may find the p-value 0.052 is slightly different. Another case is if your p-value is 0 0.051, 0 0.052,
you find there is no significant difference. However, in reality, there is a significant difference. And then the guilty guy doesn't go to the jail. So these are the two uh, potential limitations of using the hypothesis testing. We tend to make type 1 and type 2 error. After knowing this hypothesis testing, we know how we can get uh, the objective findings based on data analysis. Now, the next step is how we can provide evidence-based recommendations. Let's look at this. This is my conceptual model, which I present by the end of uh, the literature review chapter. And this is my findings which I revise, refine it a little bit. And it shows age groups are significantly related with purchasing tension, but the relationship is moderate, R equals to 0 0.57. And the con health consciousness is strongly and significantly related to the purchase intention. While gender moderates these uh, relationships, so what I can recommend to the business practitioners is, since HC and PI are strongly and positively related, strengthening the health benefits of organic food may enhance the purchase intention. Since people aging above 40, particularly 60, have stronger purchase intention than those below 40, it is recommended to define these age groups as target group. We also found males' purchase intention of organic food is more strongly related to health consciousness, so they can be the potential target group as well. Now let's recap what we have learned from this quantitative research workshop. Quantitative research is relatively more objective than qualitative research and aims at generalization. Research questions in quantitative research are more specific. We tend to use, is there a difference? Is there a relationship between variables to start the research questions? And don't be scared by the statistical analysis. Once you practice that, and then you can find it's not that difficult to understand it. For more discussions, we can arrange it in real-time discussion. Thanks for watching this video. My name is Ning Ding. If you have more questions, please feel free to contact me. I wish you enjoy your research journey.